welcome to our seminar on statistics optimization and applied mathematics. Uh, this is a big pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Gu Yong Li. Uh, he is uh, already associate professor. I, uh, I heard. Yes, okay. <laughs> I, that was approved probably a few weeks ago. Okay, uh, so congratulations. Thanks. In the uh, New South Wales University in Australia. Um, I uh, looked for some pieces of uh, information and I have to recognize I'm impressed because you produce more than 10 papers per year and mm -hmm. this is impressive for he us. He didn't count. He confessed the other day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I looked at uh, Matt Sainet uh, this morning and I found 76 papers from 2006. So it's uh, already impressive. Uh, where he was a student in uh, Hong Kong Chinese University with Professor NG. And uh, aside the 76 publications, I found 640 sites by uh, 393 authors. Uh, he's also associate editor of JOTA and Mathematics Methods of Operations Research. So uh, it's our mm, big pleasure to have you here. And you are, uh, we are our public, your public. So uh, we are yours. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, just, uh, associate professor is not the same that professor associate. Oh, no, no, no. It's the same level. Right? It's the same level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but professor, 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 no, with all of us papers. Thank you very much yes. for the invitations <coughs> and having me here is definitely a pleasure. It's my first time in LG but I was very delighted. Yeah. Um, uh, today I would like to discuss a little bit on the recent advance on <coughs> polynomial optimization. I have to emphasize this is just my personal selection because it's a rapid growing field and it's very hard to cover every aspect of it. So in case I miss anything important works, please feel free to interrupt me and uh, point it out. I will be very grateful. And uh, these are based on joint work with many of my collaborators. And they include uh, uh, John Bowen, who unfortunately passed away last year. And also my colleague Jaya Kuma at the same university as me. And uh, my co collaborators in the States, uh, Dima Dubonsky in uh, University of Washington and Boris Mutukovic from Weinstein University, and also my friends in Hong Kong, and also my kind of a mentors, which Li Chin Chi and Tin Kei Pong, they are both in the Polytech University in Hong Kong. And finally, um, Henry Wokowitz in University of Waterloo in Canada. Okay. So I definitely I own uh, all my work to them, but if you find any mistake, that should be mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, um, so because I want to talk about polynomial optimization, so I guess the first question I need to address is why polynomial optimization and why polynomial? And this is particularly important for optimizers because when we're trying to construct numerical algorithms, most of the time you probably need only the first order information and the second order information. In other words, uh, it is often assumed to be a C2 function when you're trying to implement the algorithms. So in that sense, polynomial optimization seems very, very special so that's why I need to answer the question in the front. So why we need to look at polynomial optimization. All right. So, but let me uh, answer this one in a different language because there are many answers for it, but that's going to look at what happens if we go beyond the polynomial setting and see what things will go. And I would like to say that things can go wild if you go out of the polynomial setting. And by wildness can mean a lot of things. Let me explain what I mean by wildness here. First of all, you can have very wild optimization problem. This is a standard optimization problem you can find in a textbook, for example, in Fletcher's book. So it is unconstrained one-dimensional optimization problem, minimizing an objective function formed by the sum of a polynomial 2x power 4, and the second term, which is x power 4, multiplies cos 1 over x. So remember that cos function is, lies in between minus 1 to 1, and cos 1 of x is oscillating, particularly when x approaches 0. So you will see that objective function actually lies between uh, x power 4 and 3 power x 4. So you see the graph, it is x power 4, and this is x, uh, 3 times x power 4. And when x approaches 0, you see there's a lot of oscillations in here. So what brings uh, interesting for this example is that you will see that 0 is the strict 
a local minimizer as well as a strict local global minimizer as well. But you will see a lot of uh, local minimizer that approach into this one, which means that the zero is actually not an isolated uh, uh, strict local minimizer. So which somehow a bit uh, contrast to our intuitive feeling means that we often hope that the strict local minimizer will be isolated, but when you move into non-polynomial work, this kind of thing will break. Okay. And secondly, this another interesting thing is that if you look at a even a very well-behaved function like the convex functions, a convex function which is bounded below actually need not attain its minimum if you look at non-polynomial cases. This is a very simple one-dimensional example which is exponential of x. This is bounded below by zero, but it's actually never attain its minimum. Okay. And thirdly, uh, you would have what we call the arbitrary slow grossness in a reference point. For example, this is a witness example which is popular in harmonic analysis, uh, which is defined to be exponential of minus one of x squared. And x equals zero, it is understood by the value of zero. Okay? So you can calculate its derivative. Actually, it is a C infinity function. But if you calculate any order derivative at the point zero, you will see that the high order derivative actually will vanish, which means the function actually is very flat around the point zero. So in particular, if you compare this function with any monomials, with any order, and you will see that when x approaches zero, uh, this quotient is going to be uh, converging to zero. So which means that if you're trying to compare this function with any polynomials, it's not going to be bounded away around zero. So which means it actually grows arbitrarily slow comparing to any monomials around the point zero. Right. So these are actually the wild phenomena we have seen if you go out of polynomial world. But if you restrict yourself to the polynomial world, things will behave nicely. So this is what I mean that if you restrict yourself to polynomial setting, actually all these wild phenomena actually goes away. For example, any strict local minimizer of a polynomial are isolated. Actually this probably continues to hold for analytic functions, but in particular polynomial is also true. Um, and secondly, uh, if you have a convex polynomial, if it is bounded below, actually below Sophie and Clarté proved in 2002, it always attains its minimum. So which is a very nice result. Okay, and the third result here says that if you have a polynomial, actually the growth rate is actually can be completely characterized in terms of the degree and the dimension of the underlying space, which means it will not grow arbitrarily slow. And this is often uh, we call the Loyaswitz inequality and their variance. Okay, so you see that when you restrict yourself to the polynomial setting, we, that brings a lot of interesting structure and, and good behaviors. But this is not my uh, intention of my talk. Today I'm going to tell you more about that, and that's my intention. So today the main uh, thing is about two uh, parts. The first part I'm trying to, uh, hoping to convince you that uh, if you have a polynomial optimization problem, then its global minimizer and minimum actually can be solved uh, by uh, constructing a sequence of convex programming problem. And sometimes they can be fine by just solving a single one, which is very good. And the secondly, I want to convince you that many important existing one or the new algorithm can, will behave very nicely in this polynomial setting, or sometimes can be semi-algebraic setting because the functions can be written as maximum of finally many polynomials. And we can obtain very explicit convergence rate in this case. But often, this rate are sublinear rate rather than the linear or sub superlinear rate. Okay. And this is my, uh, basically, this is the two main message I'm trying to convey. Now, let me put forward my outline. But instead of outline, I prepared this one, which is basically uh, mm -hmm. what I would do. Uh, so I first uh, introduce the motivation, which is the serve for the entry. And then the main course will be the two things I'm trying to, I just explained this part one. Uh, for global polynomial optimization, and this is for part two, which is convergence rate analysis. And finally, if you have a sweet tease, uh, I'm, I, I guess you would like the dessert part, which is the application to sparse optimization problem, and this is how I formulate my talks. Okay. So let me start with the motivation, which means that I'm going to fix up the setting, and we will go for that. Okay, so, so let me fix my setting. So I'm going to look at this class of polynomial optimization problem, which means that you, we minimize a polynomial objective function subject to the set that described by polynomial inequalities. And here, all the functions involved are just polynomials with real coefficients. Of course, you could extend the result to complex coefficients, but uh, in, at this moment, let's restrict ourselves to real coefficients because most of the applications are coming from the real coefficients at this moment. 
are you in Rn? Or? Yeah, at this moment, I'm in x in Rn, so that I can define polynomial in the usual sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But there's also other works uh, which you look at polynomial in infinite-dimensional spaces as well. Okay. Um, all right. So let me try to say that we are interesting first, in, at least in the first part, we are interested in the global minimizer and global minimum. So by that, it's probably uh, straightforward for us. But let me at least uh, clarify that. By global minimizer, I mean a feasible point, which means that the point will satisfy all the inequalities that describe your feasible region and that it has the least function value. Okay. And by the global minimum, it's basically the associated function value of a global minimizer. Okay. And here is a very simple example to illustrate that. Uh, here we have somehow two variable quadratic functions and the feasible region is just a bounded box in this case. And you can see from the graph I plotted out here, you will have only one global minimizer, but you will have a one, two, three, three local, but not global minimizers. So uh, from this example, it's interesting because you can easily extend this example because here I have two variables. You can easily extend the one to be n-dimensional example. So you replace two by n, replace the two by n here. So finally, you will end up with the example. Again, you have only one global minimizer, but you have two power n minus one local, but not global minimizers. That basically means that when the dimension n is large, uh, there will be a lot of uh, local but not global minimizers. So you cannot solve simply by enumeration in this case, even though for quadratic case and they are separable. So, so that means that we need better techniques and the problem itself can be uh, empty hard as well. Right. So this kind of problem is very hard. Uh, okay, because first of all, as I explained, these are empty hard problems. So when dimension is large, the computational cost is huge. And secondly, we also have a little bit of a methodology limitation because they are comparing to the local minimizers, uh, our techniques for finding global minimizers are relatively limited when you compare with them. Okay, so let's see how we can do it. And the general idea is very uh, it's simple, but the proving the convergence could be a bit uh, tedious. But generally, the idea is that uh, if you could construct a sequence of tractable uh, optimization problem, in this case, will be the semi-definite programming problem, which is a class of convex optimization. And if you can construct a sequence of problem, and when the approximation level goes up, and hoping that the sequence you construct can approximate the original hard problem, then you, could, you would be able to solve the original hard problem by an approximated sense. And that's the general idea. And uh, this line of approach actually is pioneered by Jean Lasalle and Pablo Parillo uh, in early 2000s. And they realized that one can construct it by using a tool from the semi-algebraic geometry called, uh, it's a German name, I'm not sure I pronounce it right or not, as a positive statisms. Uh, basically, it's a positive uh, re a representation. And they show that this, uh, uh, this sequence they constructed can convert into the original hard problem and under a very uh, mild assumption that requires competitiveness of this uh, feasible region. There is also recent work in extending the result to non-compact regions, and which are actually was done by, for example, Jia Wang Ni, and also D. Clerk and Monica Laura also attempt a lot along this line. And recently, they are also uh, attempting to extend this kind of scheme to the semi-infinite program literature. For example, I think LaSalle was first trying to do that for uh, semi-infinite programming problem in 2014. And later uh, is a joint work with uh, Jean and Jaya and also uh, my uh, Vietnamese collaborator Farm as well. We're trying to do it for the bilevel cases where all the, uh, all the functions involved are just polynomial. So that's why we call it bilevel polynomial programs. But again, we prove it under the, the convergence under the competitiveness assumptions. Okay. So, so let me try to formulate how this actually looks like but I will need a very crucial ingredient, which is the sum of square polynomial, which probably you have heard about this. Um, so it's a, um, it's a definition that appears long time ago, uh, but it's easy to stay as well. So we say a function is actually a sum of squares polynomial. If you can break it down into finite sums of uh, other polynomial squares, for example, if you can find, for example, k many of the other real polynomial fj, so that you can write fx equals the sum of fj squared, where j range from 1 to k, then we call f is a sum of squares polynomial. 
So from the definition, you can easily see that uh, uh, any sum of squares polynomial must take non-negative value because they are sum of squares. And in general, it is actually an easier way for you to recognize the polynomial actually takes non-negative value. For example, in here, so you can uh, look at the first three terms, complete to square, and then the second term, so the last term is actually itself a square. So in particular, there will be a sum of squares. Okay. So as I said before, any sum of squares polynomial is non-negative, but the converse is actually not true, and actually it's a, a famous question asked by Hilbert, which is the Hilbert 17th question. Uh, whether the converse is uh, true or not. Actually, uh, later on, he himself proved that it's not true, but he couldn't find the explicit counterexamples. Later on, counterexample was found uh, by, for example, Motzkin and Robinson as well. But the important thing actually realized by an optimizer, which is Shaw in 1987, is that checking a polynomial is sum of squares or not actually is a equivalent to uh, solve a feas feasibility problem of a semi-definite program problem. And this is often what we call the grand matrix method. And that was discovered by Shaw. So which means that testing whether polynomial sum of squares basically is tractable. It can be turned into a semi-definite program problem. Okay. And if you are, uh, so if you forget about what is semi-definite problem, this is a very quick reminder. It is basically an extension of a linear programming to the symmetric space setting. So whenever you see a vector variable, you replace it by a symmetric matrix variable. Whenever you see a non-negative constraint, you replace it by positive semi-definite constraint. And they are, we are having uh, quite a lot of uh, powerful software these days. For example, Sadumi and SDPT3 is suitable for small to medium-sized problem. And SDP now is a large-scale semi-definite programming software developed by the National University of Singapore's team. Okay. Yes. Okay. And they have lots of applications. You can find this application, for example, in Stephen Boyd's uh, survey article and also his book as well. Okay, so let me come to this uh, sequential approximation. Remember, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, so let's try to see how we can construct a sequence of problems so that we can approximate this original hard problem. So um, the idea is very simple. We're trying to somehow, if you look at here, we're trying to find the best possible or the largest possible scalar mu so that if you look at here, this is actually, you can think of this as a generalized uh, Lagrangian. So basically you replace the Lagrange multiplier by a sum of squares uh, polynomial. So you have f plus sum of sigma g and minus mu. And instead of requiring to be non-negative, we require to be a sum of squares. Okay. And we somehow restrict the degree of the sum of square polynomials uh, by the constant 2k, where k is the, uh, an integer you fix beforehand. So the interesting thing is that if you fix the, uh, the integer k, remember the checking whether a polynomial is sum of squares or not can be written as a semi-definite programming problem. So this is actually can be equivalent be written as a semi-definite programming problem, even though you're taking the maximum over mu and the polynomial sigma i, because you restrict the degree as a fix, so you can identify the polynomial with fixed degree to a finite dimensional space by looking at their coefficients. So essentially, this is a finite dimensional programming problem and can be written as a semi-definite programming problem. And the only thing is that you're trying to see whether when the k actually increase, which means that at the end, you are hoping that you don't have any control in the degree of these representations, the optimal value will reach the optimal value of the original problem. And this is actually proved by LaSalle and Pablo that this can be done by assuming a compactness assumption of the feasible region. And this is their contribution. And also, I think later on, they also find out that uh, you can also find a, a global solutions by checking the rank uh, transition over what we call the moment matrix associated to this semi-definite problem. problem. Okay. And that's what their uh, contributions. Uh, but, the, uh, but you may be wondering, okay, the original problem is very hard, but you are approximated by tractable problems, so the difficulty must be somewhere. Actually, the difficulties come seen is that when the, uh, uh, the integer k, which is the approximation level, or when the dimension of the space is actually large, then the corresponding computational cost is actually very high. So this is the price we pay. When you move, so you, you may be able to solve when k is small or n is small, but when the k and n are large, the corresponding computational core is still large. And in general, if you really want to solve up to a high approximation level, you really need to explore the structure. And that's what in general it is. Let me give you some numerical examples so you can have some idea. 
Okay, so the here, let me pick one example, uh, which is conveniently taken from one, one of my articles with Li Qun and his postdoc, Gao Hang Yu, in 2013. So here we're trying to minimize a degree four polynomials over the three co constraints. So this uh, polynomial optimization problem has its origin in hypergraph theory, because this is actually equivalent to finding the analytic connectivity of the hypergraph. But we formulate it as a, a polynomial optimization problem to solve it. And what is interesting is that if you look at the last row, uh, when the dimension of the, which means that you have 60 variables in this case, and the equivalent semi-definite programming problem in the second level, which is not that large, has almost 2,000 a variable, which means that you are dealing with 2,000 times 2,000 matrix. And what is more remarkable is the number of linear constraints is almost, almost 600k linear constraints. So you really need to call the uh, large-scale semi-definite programming solver, and it probably take them for almost one hour to reach the global optimality. So actually you will see that even for 60-dimensional uh, problem, which is not that large, because we want to solve up to the global optimality, so the computational cost actually is quite huge in here. So if you try to move up the dimension up to 100, sometimes I guess most of the cases your, your laptop will run off memory in that case. So at this moment, this technique is restricted to dimension up to a f a 100 at this moment, if you do not exploit any special structure. Okay. But if you can exploit a special structure, you, might, you can solve very large scale problem. And this is another uh, example case in point, which is uh, I choose it from the Kojima and his two collaborators' work, uh, Waki and Song Yong Kim, which is a Korean lady, in 2009. And they were trying to solve what we call the Rosenbrock function. It's a standard test function in the optimization literature. And this polynomial has very special structure in the sense it is very sparse. So if you look at all the monomials appear in this polynomial, so only those terms with e either xi or xi squared, all those terms xi and xi minus 1 are appear in the monomials. Others are actually with coefficients 0. That means this polynomial actually is very sparse in the sense that you only have a few monomials with non-zero coefficients. Okay, if you can exploit this kind of sparse property and you do a little analysis, you will be able to solve actually uh, the, uh, the dimension will be up to 20,000 and so on. Okay and with a reasonable time also, here probably take 10 minutes. So actually this one has, has also been extended to cover problems with unbounded physical sets. That's uh, uh, one of my joint work with Jaya and also this uh, Korean lady Kim and also another Korean collaborator, uh, Go Ming Lee in Pokyung National University in 2015. Okay, so, so now let me ask the probably an interesting question, probably from the theoretical point of view, rather than the computational point of view, is that uh, we have seen that in general, you need to solve a sequence of semi-definite programming problem to reach the optimal value. But what is more interesting probably is that whether you can just solve it by one single semi-definite programming problem. That's what we mean by exact semi-definite program relaxations. And in particular, we are interested in whether you can solve by solving the one with the most the smallest size which is the, I will pick the one, which is appear as the first one in the approximation hierarchy or approximation sequence. Because the first one, when k is fixed to be this number, that's the one you start from, which has the smallest size. So in that sense, you will be able to solve your original problem by solving a one single semi-definite programming problem and with the most economical size in that sense. Okay, and that's what our general question. But of course, you might ask, whether it's possible or not. Because I'm asking that original or hard problem that can be realized by solving a problem which is tractable. But remember that the original problem in general is MP hard. So you should ask the question whether it's possible or not, whether I'm asking too much. And the answer is indeed yes, because we have already results, at least in very special cases, you can do it. First of all, in the trust region problem, which is, has been analyzed for a long time, where you minimize non-convex objective functions subject to norm constraint, this can be done. Uh, and also for quadratic optimization problem involving some kind of suitable sign structure, which we call Z-matrix structure, which means that off-diagonal elements are actually non-positive, you can also do it. So basically means that in the quadratic uh, literature, you will be able to do it a little bit. Now we're trying to see in the more general case, which is polynomial setting, whether one can do it or not. 
And that's the hard question in here. So I so let me look at oh, oh can I go next oh so okay so this is the basic question can we identify classes so that admits the exact semi-definite program relaxations and are these classes actually easily verifiable and whether they are meaningful or not okay. and the basic approach is two things first of all we try and exploit the hidden complexity and secondly we try to use tools from semi-algebraic geometry. And I guess the approach here is very natural because I'm trying to say that original hard problem can be realized by solving a single semi-definite programming problem, which is in particular a convex problem. So it must be some kind of hidden convexity over there. And secondly, because I'm solving polynomial optimization problem, so those tools from the algebraic geometry would be a big help. So, and indeed, that's our basic approach, and you will see that. But the first thing is that searching the class often is a non-trivial task. So I guess uh, when we search in the dusk, uh, we don't know what class we should look at. Often what we do is to look at examples. That gives us some motivation or shed some light. Right? So let me look at an example. And this simple example actually motivates the class we're going to look at. So these are simple examples. I'm going to minimize this polynomial with degree 6 and 3 variables um, over somehow another, uh, over a region that defined by another polynomials in here. So um, you can see somehow this function f, although it's very complicated, but you, if you ignore this, what I call diagonal part, which means xi power 6 in here, and all the other terms that will have somehow non-positive coefficients. Okay? And similarly, the same structure can be set for the constraint function because you only have these diagonal terms in here. And if you solve this one, actually you could uh, solve to its KKT conditions analyzed by dividing cases, you will see that this one is actually the global minimizer where all the components take the same value and minus one is the optimal value. And you could solve its uh, uh, first relaxation problem in the approximation hierarchy, you will see that the relaxation is actually tight here because they have the same optimal value here. So from this example, it's tempting to say that possibly this kind of polynomial is the one I should look at and indeed it is the case. And let me name this one by polynomials with essentially non-positive coefficients. So what we do is that given a polynomial, we break it down into three parts. The first part is the diagonal term, which is have xi power p, and p is the degree of the polynomial. And f0 is the constant part, and what are, and what are remaining we put into the second term. And we say a polynomial is, has essentially non-positive coefficients if all those co coefficients in the second part actually is non-positive. So essentially, the example I put forward is basically a, an example because uh, ignore these constant, uh, sorry, the diagonal terms and they don't have constant parts, all the left terms have non-positive coefficients. So you can see that this kind of polynomial can be easily identified by just examining the coefficients in here. So now let's come to our first uh, main result, saying that if all the polynomials are essentially non-positive coefficients and a strict feasibility condition holds, then you would have the exact semi-definite program relaxation. And you, can and you can also find out the global minimizer by checking, uh, as the general scheme, you by checking the rank conditions as well. And it has applications in other areas, for example, uh, in tensor computations, because Many tensor computations, those tensors coming from these probability tensors, they are having non-negative entries. So in particular, they have non-negative entries here. So if you're trying to find the maximum of them, it's equivalent to look at the infimum of minus of it, and then they will have non-positive coefficients in that case. And naturally, you will have applications over there. Okay. So that's one immediate application. And you may be wondering how we do it. And as I said, this is exactly how we do it by the basic approaches, uh, using the hidden convexity plus the semi-algebraic results. So the semi-algebraic result says that uh, a polynomial, if they have essentially non-positive coefficients, non-negativity is equivalent to sum of squares, and also the hidden convexity says that if you look at this joint range set plus the non-negative orthogonal, it is a convex set. Okay. So using these two facts, you will be able to prove the results easily because uh, all you need to do is just use your, our common techniques by uh, convex separation with the optimal value coupled with the zeros and separate the point with this convex set. And then you will have 
the um, Lagrangian function is actually minus the optimal value is non-negative. And using the first result, and realize that the uh, Lagrangian function is actually with essentially non-positive coefficients, that tells you that the Lagrangian function minus optimal value is actually sum of squares, and that's all. And basically, it's applications of this hidden convexity result and the semi-algebraic result. And I would like to emphasize this semi-algebraic result was um, actually we proved it in an independent way, but uh, in the reviewing process, uh, the um, the referee kindly alert us there's already another proof based on al completely algebraic proof uh, documented in other papers. So it's our honor to cite that paper as well and also uh, prove it using an elementary way. Okay. Okay. So, so let me finish this one, but uh, let me also emphasize that you can also do other things not only for polynomial, but you can also do further things on quadratic case as well. And this is a very simple example where you look at what we call the extended trust region problem. So uh, for trust region problem, you just ignore all these linear constraints. Uh, so if you add these li additional linear constraints to the trust region problem, you form what we call the extended trust region problem. And this kind of problem occurs when, for example, um, in when you apply trust region techniques uh, with additional to nonlinear problem with additional linear inequalities, you can have this kind of sub problem to solve. And secondly, it also arises in robust optimization problem where the norm constraint describes the norm uncertainty set or the ball uncertainty set, and the linear constraint describes the polyhedral uncertainty set. And that's where it comes from. Okay. And in general, it's non convex and MP hard as well because A is not positive semi definite in general. And even the uh, quadratic optimization problem with box constraint, in particular if you ignore this one, then it's already an MP hard problem. So if you take the ball to be large enough to uh, cover the linear constraints, you will cover the quadratic optimization with box, which in particular is an MP-hard problem. So the model problem is itself is an MP-hard problem in general. What we can do is that if you are uh, assuming somehow a dimension conditions, uh, which means the, uh, the dimension of this um, eigenspace associated to the minimum eigenvalue is, is uh, greater or equal to a number s plus 1, s is the dimension of the span of the linear coefficients in here, and together with the strict feasibility conditions, you will prove, you can prove the exact SDP relaxations. And in particular, if you let this number of e linear inequality to be zero, which means that the s to be zero here, and this condition is going to be satisfied always, so you just collapse to what you have for the uh, literature for trust region problem. So this can be think of as extension of the uh, exact relaxation for the trust region problem in that sense. Okay. And again, the idea to prove it is just to exploit the hidden convexity in this case. So exactly the same uh, set you, will, you can prove. Uh, you can prove this actually convex under the dimension condition we have. Today. And that's all and how we prove it. Okay, so let me summarize the first part. Actually, the first part actually uh, can be summarized by this following diagram. So what I would call it, we are essentially going back and forward between the convexity world and the polynomial world. For example, in convex optimization, what you do is that you use Farkas lemma to write as KKD system, and you solve the KKD system, and you get the solutions. But when you move into non-convex world, in particular polynomial world, uh, we use some kind of form which is uh, similar to Farkas lemma, what we call the positive uh, representation result, we write down the global optimality condition. That can be written as a sum of squares optimization problem, which itself can be re equivalently written as SDP. Then you go back to the convex world so that you can solve it. So that's what I mean by going back and forth between the convex world and the general polynomial world. Okay. So th uh, this, uh, I think, is a beautiful analogy here comparing to the convex uh, world in here. So that's very interesting. So that's my first part, I think. So let me check the time. Okay, so and, uh, let me quickly go to the second part. And the second part, I'm going to explain how we can use the polynomial structure to analyze the convergence rate. Okay. So let me start with the uh, general problem, which is the, this feasibility problem. So I'm going to find a point in the intersection of finally many closed sets. And this kind of setting can be found by, uh, for example, reconstruction problem and optimization problem as well. And a typical uh, uh, case in point is finding the uh, sparse solution, which means you're trying to find 
a vector which is, has the least non-zero entry, so they satisfy linear equations. And the general problem can be uh, very much simplified in terms of intersection just two sets, because you can, by finding the intersection of the sets, where all the coordinates are the same and the product of all the sets. So basically you can reduce the general setting to just two sets are involved, and also one of them is actually convex because it's just a fine space. Right. So uh, there are many uh, algorithms, but one of them is the alternating projection algorithms. So basically, let me illustrate with these uh, pictures. So what happens is you start from the point arbitrarily init initialize, project to the first set and then project the second set, and then you repeat the process. And you will see often they zigzagly converge into the intersection point. Okay. And it, in the convex case, it has been well analyzed. In particular, it always converges. And Heinz and John Bowen proved that whenever you have uh, the intersection have non-empty interior, you have linear convergence. But what is less unknown is what happens when this condition fails. Okay. And this is actually important because in general, because you want to find a point in the intersection, uh, if you assume this one, you somehow assuming that you have some knowledge about the intersection. And secondly, uh, you may not have interior at all, just like this one, the intersection just a singleton, so you don't have interior at all. Okay. And actually an uh, answer at least a partial answer can be given when you assume that all the set has some suitable polynomial structures. For example, if you assume all the sets are described by convex polynomials, you can obtain an explicit convergence rate, which is a sublinear convergence rate. And the rate is a bit complicated, but actually only depends on the degree of the polynomials that defines the sets and also the dimension n of the underlying space. Okay, so you can completely describe the convergence rate. And the way we prove it is using the, uh, what we call the Loyaswitz inequality, which is you bounded uh, the solution set of, or the zero set of the polynomial by the function value itself. And often this uh, exponent beta and rho are just existence, and they are very hard to compute in general. And the uh, extension of this kind of rule has been done by uh, Jerome Bolt and Iris Dantidis and Adrian Lewis to the non-smooth setting. But there's an independent line by estimating the exponent rho here. And this is actually very important because the ex exponent actually characterizes the convergence rate of the algorithm. And this is another line which I spell out some of the contribution. For example, the first one is by Gostowitz. He proved that when it's polynomial and you have strict local minimized assumptions, you can completely characterize this uh, exponent. And this is possibly the best uh, possible exponent because he has an example where the exponent is achieved and you could extend it to the non-smooth case and these are the recent works done by for example Janos Koller and recently with John and his postdoc as well and with Boris and Pham and also with my uh, friend Tin K. Pong in Hong Kong we do basically for the non-smooth cases where we can identify explicitly what are the exponent rule over there and from here you can actually prove what you uh, the convergence rate explicitly, because what you do is that you just bound the distance to the intersection via the function value that all the polynomials that describe your sets, and the convergence behavior just can be analyzed using the polynomials over there. And that's very uh, easy to analyze by looking at the polynomials rather than the set itself. Okay, if you go back to the previous example, which is just the uh, two disks, they have one singleton as in intersections. And you can directly compute that the convergence rate is 1 over root k, but actually uh, uh, by this uh, estimate, you actually get 1 over k power 1 over 6. So basically it means that although our theorem works for general cases, but in general it's not tight. Okay. So there's our recent works that you can sharpen the rate, in particular look at the semi-definite program structure, and uh, you can look at, for example, the paper with Dima and Henry uh, uh, just appear in this year. Okay, so let me look at the time. I guess uh, I a little bit run out of time. So let me uh, possibly um, quickly go through a uh, last one. So which says that actually similar techniques you can also use to analyze the convergence rate for other algorithms. For example, the proximal point algorithms like uh, the one uh, investigated uh, by Tuch, Jerome Bolt, and also together with Swite as well. And also you can use it to analyze the 
a new variant of Docker switch for algorithm as well. So that's what we have done. Okay, so because the time is short, so I may go, let me go forward a little bit. <laughs> um, so this one, uh, maybe let me uh, briefly explain what we do uh, just quickly. Um, so the Docker search for algorithm is looks like the followings. Um, so it is, uh, so you do two reflections and take the average, uh, but it's well understood in the convex case, but in the non-convex as well, it's less understood and it is not known how they actually performed. So although it has been applied very successfully to many applications, so the only result uh, I find at this moment is only uh, Frank and John's result, but works for a very specific instance for a circle and a straight line R2. So it's tempting to ask what happens for the general cases, but there's a general counterexample saying that you can hope for a general result because there's a counterexample saying that it can uh, fail to converge for a particular setting. So uh, you might be wondering, is there any variance of it so that you can keep up the good numerical performance and also the global convergence result? And one can come up with this one by analyzing a more general form and specialized to the setting where the particular ex, uh, assumption is going to be satisfied. And that's how we did it in one of the examples. But I would probably uh, brief and scale. And But uh, let me uh, just present the numerical results. And the new uh, Docker search for algorithm we proved, which have global convergence, actually is, uh, performs uh, equally better in the easy cases, but much better in the harder cases where when the dimension n is large, which is up to 6,000. And in the 50 trials, we are all successful, but the classical one can have uh, half of them actually fail. So which says that uh, it could be uh, interesting over there as well. So let me try to conclude. <laughs> so I'm hoping to convince you that uh, uh, the polynomial setting is very good. And let me quote Alexander Gwosendik saying that polynomial world is a nice contest for us to live, breathe, and work. And in, in some sense, I would like to uh, convince you that the tools from semi-algebraic geometry, together with the powerful convexity, tells us to how to extend results from quadratic case to polynomial cases. And finally, with this semi-algebraic setting, we will be able to get explicit estimate for the convergence rate. And that's uh, what my message is. So I think I should probably stop here. Thanks very much. So if you want to have about the reference, I list the reference in here. Um, so the first one is the projection algorithm jointly with John Bowen and his postdoc, and recently with Dima and Henry as well. And for this error bound and these uh, Loyasvich exponents, so this is basically in the paper with Boris and Farm, and also with my friend Tinke as well, which just appear in Foundation Computation and Mathematics. And finally with the Dog storage for algorithm again with Tin K, and finally with the um, alternative theorem and applications that was with John Will with Lichin. So I probably should stop here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, you're very sharp with the time. You don't have to suffer too much with the time. Uh, is there any question? Could you put the other slide, the previous one, the first part of the references? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's no problem Thank at all. You. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and, and just uh, the importance of uh, these polynomials with the other sounds of the squares. No? <laughs> and this is the <coughs> Some more comments, questions? Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your talk. I uh, appreciate very much your effort to, to show what we say, to, to show the music, because sometimes the lyrics is uh, in much uh, specific. But uh, uh, yes, a, a curiosity in is somehow to use uh, induction, uh, for example, in proofs like in of a wolf or in this kind of uh, research because uh, Clate uh, was here in 2002 ah, and he showed uh, this uh, result and he uh, told us a, a proof by induction in the dimension of yes. the space. So is, is induction useful in general for methods or not, not so. Uh, at least for the, f uh, the proof of Frank Wolf, the induction argument was very crucial because what in sense, uh, what Klatesh, I also I explore his techniques in the, my error bound paper yeah. as well. So what happens is that uh, you could start with one dimensional case, yeah. which is very easy to analyze. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you go up to high dimension, you can divide into two cases. If it's bounded, then you, could, you are done in that case because for the existence. If it's not bounded, there's a one recession direction. And that recession direction, you can actually, by polynomial structure, you can show that the reverse direction is also in the re recession direction. Then you can mod out this subspace and reduce it to one dimension less. And that's how his uh, induction argument uh, yeah. was there. But I think it's very, actually very important because he actually make use of polynomial structure so that he can argue that the reverse direction is also in the recession cone so that you can mod out this dimension to go down to the lower dimensional cases. It's a very intricate argument, I think. But I think in particular, it makes use of the polynomial structure in here. So it's a, I would say it's a very beautiful combination of polynomial structure together with convexity because he used recession cone ideas. But case. you see, the recession cone is always a subspace. Any, any a recession direction, the opposite is also in the... It's only for the polynomial case, convex K, K, K. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks very uh, much. <laughs> Thank you.